According to Wikipedia, Bertrand Picard is a Swiss psychiatrist and balloonist. That is something of an understatement. Bertrand did indeed qualify as a psychiatrist from the University of Lausanne, but he's best known as an explorer, an aviator, and a communicator. He comes from a family of explorers, and we're recording this here in his home, in part of it, which is essentially a museum to the exploits of his family. His grandfather, Auguste, invented the pressurized balloon capsule and took it to 16,201 meter height in 1932. He was the first human to see the curvature of the planet with his own eyes. His father, not to be outdone, designed a submarine and went to the bottom of the Marianas Trench in 1960, 10,916 meters down. Now, if that had been my grandfather and my father, I probably would have become an accountant. But Bertrand followed in their footsteps. He made the first non-stop round-the-world balloon flight, that was 1999, with co-pilot Brian Jones. And then the first round-the-world flight in an electric aeroplane with well, sharing different segments of the flight with André Boschberg. So it, Bertrand now runs something called the Solar Impulse Foundation uh, and the World Alliance for Efficient Solutions, working to put together a portfolio of a thousand technology solutions that could be applied now that are more efficient, more cost-effective, but also better than the planet, for the planet than the alternatives. And I'm very proud to say that I've been uh, a member of the advisory board from the beginning of that effort. And we're at, how many solutions have we got today? 650. 650. 650. I, I checked today on the internet, it's 652. <laughs> 652. So um, now, let me, I wanna, before we talk about the foundation though, I wanna go back and talk about, I've got to ask you questions about these extraordinary adventures. I mean. Yes, of course, Michael. You, did, you, did you always know that you would find some challenge and sort of following your father and your grandfather's footsteps? Is that something that you grew up knowing you had to do? I really wanted to have this type of life, the type of life of my father, of my grandfather, but also of the astronauts that I met when I was a child, the first astronaut, the right stuff from the American space program. But I was 11 years old, 12 years old, and I was a bit depressed because I wanted to be an explorer and I did not know what was left to explore. When Apollo 11 landed on the moon, I thought everything has been made. So, so this is when you go back to 11 or 12, you visited Cape Canaveral. Yes. And um, who did you, did you get to meet anybody? I mean, with, with, uh... Well, Werner von Braun, right. the head of the Apollo mission program, was a friend of the family, became a friend of the family. And then all the American astronauts, Alan Shepard, John Glenn, uh, Wally Shearer, Scott Carpenter, uh, so this is who you were just hanging out with when you were yeah, 11 or 12? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you thought, well, they, but they've done everything. I thought they've done everything, but what was amazing for me was to read books about the conquest of space and the next day to meet all the guys that were in the books, which means that there was, for me as a kid, no gap between the dream and the reality. And I started to think everything that you dream, you, you, you can do. So that's kind of like me coming here and meeting you. <laughs> or no gap. Meeting you because, no, well, of course we've because met, you've done a lot of things you've we, done so many things michael we've met many times so i think any any if i was ever starstruck that may have faded a little bit and possibly vice versa but but that's now i'm just trying to do the mental arithmetic which year were you that 11 12 year old in cape canaveral 1969 and i witnessed okay. i witnessed six launches of apollo missions Okay, but then there was and 30 years before you did your own balloon circumnavigation. Yes. So did you just sort of say, well, everything's been done. I'll just go and become a psychiatrist and go and live in Switzerland. Everything's nice and safe and boring. And uh, in the beginning, I thought everything is safe and boring. And then I started to have a compass in, in my mind showing not the north, but the unknown. Everything that had not been done. 
And each time there was something new, I tried. Uh, the first hang glider I saw in the Swiss Alps, I thought, that's for me. The first micro light I saw, I thought, that's for me. And I flew with the hang glider, making loopings, championships, big firsts, uh, jumping from balloons, uh, flying with motorized hang glider. And then I was invited to participate to the first transatlantic balloon flight. Five balloons starting from Bangor in Maine with the goal of being the first in Europe. And my balloon went one. And that was, was that the solo, trigger. Or was that no, we were two. two. It was okay. with, a, with a Belgium uh, pilot, Wim Verstraten. And I was a complete newcomer in the world of ballooning. But nevertheless, we won the race. And that was the trigger for the run wow. around. I mean, there is, you, you realize there is an alternative universe, a parallel universe, where during that period, you discovered freestyle skiing. And, uh, and became a, a superb freestyle skier and then went to the Olympics in 1992 in Albertville and we would have met there instead of, uh, instead of on the talking circuit talking it, about clean energy. It, it could have been, uh, and basically it should have been because we ski in the same place in Les Diablerets, the same mountain village in Switzerland, you and me. Exactly, we could have met there and, uh, and, and, it, and who knows, maybe I would have become the balloonist. Yes. <laughs> Well, anyway, if, I, if I could have yeah. made, the, made myself Bloomberg New Energy, it would have been good also. I think we've both been... We've because both you been, were a pioneer in that field. Yes, I mean, look, it's not, um, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't ballooning or flying around the world, but it certainly, you know, it was, it was, it was, um, very it was pretty useful. pioneering. It was pretty pioneering, definitely. But, um, so you went on from that first balloon race, and then you got, then you got caught up in the whole ballooning round the, yes. round the planet. Yes. And that was quite a, I mean, there was... There was um, uh, Branson and Fossett. Fossett. And there were a lot of people trying yes, to do that. Other people from the Hilton uh, team and the Remax team. There were 10 teams wanting to go around the world. And most of them had tried already and failed. And here I was again, the little bit naive newcomer. And I said, why not me? And I found Breitling, the watch company, yeah. as, a, as a sponsor. And uh, had my balloon built in the UK at Cameron Balloons. And all these other guys, they were trying, and I was really not ready at all. And, but they failed so many times, but finally, I was ready. I failed twice, but they continued to fail. That's right, because yours was Breitling Orbiter 3. Breitling Orbiter 3, because there was right. the first one, the second one, and finally we succeeded. And that was really interesting, because we succeeded, because at each attempt, we changed everything. Right. And all the other competitors, they were continuing exactly with the same mistakes, the same technologies and the same strategies that were not relevant. And this is why they kept on failing for the same reason. And this is going to be relevant when we talk about clean technologies, yes. because um, if we then, okay, so you went, you, you circumnavigated the, the world in, a, in a, the planet in a balloon. And then a few years later, you decided to do the same thing or similar thing in an electric aeroplane. Well, basically it was not a few years later that I decided. It was about, 10 minutes after the oh, landing really? of Breitling Orbiter 3. Is that right? Yeah, because you know, I landed in the Egyptian desert with Brian Jones, and out of the 3.7 tons of liquid gas that took us around the world nonstop, there was 40 kilos left. And that was really the maximum. And this is when I thought, it's not the sky that is the limit, it's the fuel. Right. Ah. And okay. if I want, and, and I thought, okay, Breitling Orbiter 3 made the longest flight in history. The 19 days, yeah, almost 20 hours, days, right. and uh, 45,000 yeah. kilometers. And I thought we're out of fuel at the landing. If I want to do better, I have to get rid of the fuel. And this is why I started to dream of a solar-powered airplane that could fly perpetually. Because you, okay, so if you look at the timeline, then you, I'm, I've got it. I actually, I, I, so you announced Solar Impulse in 2003. Yes. So what you're saying is you didn't even take. You know, I thought that was like two, three years off, uh, you know, going back to being a sort of a psychiatrist and uh, no, I had time to, in the fact I had to go in speaking needed. tours and ceremonies and right, right, right. things like that. Okay. That took a lot of time, but I always so, had in my mind, I want to do this solar so powered airplane. When's the last time you practiced as a psychiatrist? Other um, than every day when you're motivating and... Uh, well, professionally, it's a few years a back, few years back. Okay. but uh, sometimes I practice with friends of, of mine and I do hypnosis sessions oh, wow. to, to help them. Hypnosis is really 
what is in, in, in psychiatry and psychotherapy, the spirit of exploration. Because with hypnosis, you really explore the human mind. And this is why I love hypnosis. And I used it a lot to, to help my friends or friends of my children. self-hypnosis as well. Also, not, in the balloon, in solar and, and, and in, in, in order to get through these extended periods yes. without sleep and so on. Yeah, exactly. See, I've read, I've read the... Uh, I read the book about the balloon flight and, and as much as I could about the uh, about solar impulse because it was a tremendously um, exciting. You didn't have the experience of what it was like to be a spectator or a, um, you know, um, an observer, um, but you know it was very slick. It was very well done. Your team did a fan, absolutely fantastic job. It was a big team work, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. and um, and of course the operations director, who's actually um, uh, the the the. the was a big, I, I, I know it well. No, the no, flight no, director. No, the, America, the, 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 chap who, the chap who organized for the, um, for the plane to be in a hangar at every stop. Uh, um, Gregory Blatt? Gre yeah, Gregory, Gregory Blatt. Blatt. Gregory. Amazing guy. He was, our, he was our chief worry officer. Yeah. The guy solving and, all the problems. The biggest problems we gave him and said, oh, that's easy for me. <laughs> and I'm going to turn to the camera. Gregory, if you're watching this, I'm really sorry I blanked your name because obviously I, I know you well and I, and I wish you well if you're watching this. But, you know, you did have a huge and, and, and very effective team and the communications, you know, the ability to kind of observe and, and see, uh, you know, the, the cockpit view and the view of the plane yes, and, all the and the, all of the, the, um, the data that the plane was know, sometimes it was, it was a little bit embarrassing because uh, when I had all the cameras on me and I was flying the plane and was eating and some sauce uh, <laughs> fell on my flying suit and I said, oh shit. And then there was the voice from the Monaco Control Center saying, Bertrand, please behave your life on got, internet. You've got, the are, you've got the Pope on the other line. <laughs> and there are 100,000 of people watching you behave. <laughs> okay, but let me ask you this. What is, you know, from all of that, we're going to dive into a few different aspects of what the messaging, what the, what the learnings are. But what did, what did you personally take away? If, if you could say there's one thing that kind of informs your life or one thing that you found striking about that whole um, extreme experience, what would it be? The worst is not to fail. The worst is not to try. The worst because is not to fail. The worst, the worst is not, is to, not try. to try. Okay. Because there were so many moments where I would have quit if I was afraid of failing. You should not be afraid of failing. You should just go for it. But each time you fail, you have to change your strategy, adapt your technology in order to never fail twice for the same reason. I, I like it, but I worry. I worry because it's very easy to say those things once you succeed. Yes, but I failed and several times before. And I tell you, they were big, big failures. Brightling Orbiter 1, I ditched in the Mediterranean after six hours of flight, just after the press conference when I said I would fly around the world in three weeks. Right. So you cannot be more ridiculous in front of the so media. I was worried, you know, I was at Harvard Business School, and we had these yeah. um, you know, executives would come in, and they would talk to us, and they were all enormously successful, right? Because if they weren't successful, they wouldn't get right. invited. And there was an element of luck. Some of them were... Not, I'm not remotely suggesting this is the case here, but some of them were not impressive, but incredibly lucky. Yes. And they still got to come and talk to Harvard Business yeah, School. Yeah, I see what you mean. But so maybe I was lucky to succeed and I was unlucky to fail twice. So at the end, the average is okay. Uh, you know, <laughs> as, a, as a skier, I'm also aware that there is an element of luck. You know, there is, you, you, can, you, know, you can ski the same line and then eight times out of 10, you get to the bottom and two times out of the 10, yes. you don't. And if they do that on competition, but you know what is win. luck? You know what is luck? What is, luck is when opportunities meet preparation. preparation. Yes. We were yes. really well prepared. Yes. And I remember on the yeah. 17th day of the flight with Brightling Orbiter 3, the wind took us in the wrong direction at the wrong speed. It was a disaster and I thought we would fail. And I pushed the balloon using a lot of propane. I pushed the balloon the highest I could. And in the last 100 meters, the direction turned direction 26 changed. degrees back on track. But the balloon was ready yeah. to be able to reach this altitude. I was trained to be able to do yeah. this maneuver. So, of course, yeah. if the wind was not good at this altitude, I would have failed uh, once more. But at least we're ready to take that opportunity. Yes. Yeah. And that, I mean, as a, from the entrepreneurial story of new energy finance, you know, I 
managed to navigate this company through yes. um, the winds of uh, yeah. the business winds. And but maybe it was the preparation that yes. I had. I had I have lived through the dot com boom bust. I had done all sorts of you know crazy mm. silly and things. Probably had the big problems um, in some of the financial yeah. crises before. So it, it's kind of I do hear what yeah. you know, and, and as I say, that I'm not suggesting for a moment that you were the lucky one out of the ten teams on Brightling. Or but maybe what yeah. I can also say that I learned is the fact that when you have a setback, you have to find the learning out yes. of it. And very often there was a crisis, there was a big problem. And we thought, what is the opportunity behind it? Yeah. And very often, thanks to the crisis we went through, we found much better solutions than what we had in the, in the beginning. Yes, and I think your point about not just doing the same thing, Albert Einstein famously says in Madness is doing the same thing again and again, yes. expecting a different result. Um, and there are so many lessons for our kind of planetary crisis mm -hmm. or, or situation. that we'll, we'll You know, this yeah. is like the bee and the wasp. In a room, if you have several windows with just one open and the other one closed, the bee will fly to the first window, crash on the glass, and die there after days trying to go through the glass. Right. The bee will try every window until it finds the window that is open. I mean, the wasp, the wasp goes back to the same window. So you said no, the bee. No, the bee. So no, no, which, the one, bee which one is smart? The, the wasp. The wasp, okay. The bee goes to the first window and stays there. Oh, I see, okay. And the wasp. Yeah. tries every window until it finds the one that is open and can escape. Really? Yeah. And so, you need yeah. the strategy of the wasp, the wasp thing if you want to, to succeed in something that is new. Because what is really interesting with Brightling Orbiter, with Solar Impulse, is that there was no benchmark at all. Everybody was telling me it's impossible. And nobody could really help me doing it. So it was a team effort trying to invent to totally new solutions yeah. and create a better outcome. It's very interesting because and there's, I can't remember his name, but there's the great Formula One engineer who built the Red Bull uh, technology. And he said, you're not trying to build the best car. You're trying to build the best platform so you can always learn and improve. Yes. And it's exactly, yeah. it is, it, this is yeah, very, it's profound, a very, good it's very profound stuff. Yeah. I want to ask you about, um, uh, well, actually, before I do ask about electric aviation, the role, your role and Andre's role, Andre Boschberg, you're not co-pilot because you alternated. You were exactly. never in the plane at the same time. Yeah, exactly. What did he, I see him as the engineer and you as the kind of visionary and fundraiser. Yeah, that's is that exactly. fair or is that, yes. am, I doing, am I doing you a disservice? Or him no, no, a disservice? no, 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 it's exactly, it's exactly this. I, I had this vision, I had this dream, I wanted to do it. I spoke about it to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology who said, oh, let's make a feasibility study. Right. And they called André to run the feasibility study. And that's how I met André. And uh, we were so different that I told him, I would like to work with you. Come, wow. come, in, come in the team, we partner, we partner in, this, in this project. We co-lead the project because he was the organizer, the planner. I'm the intuitive visionary and you need both. Right. You and need the one who solves the problem of today and you need the one who dreams about after tomorrow. So, so it wasn't that EPFL or the Swiss Institute of Technology said, we've got this crazy Andre Boschberg guy, we need to get rid of him somehow, take, take him as a co-pilot, please. <laughs> no, 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 because in the beginning, they presented me, Andre, as the one who could run the feasibility study. And that's yeah. all, just a, just a yes. study, just a desk study. And at the end of the nine months of the study, oh, yeah. uh, it was clear that Andre and I would be better together than, than separately. Uh, I'm always laughing, saying we made one and one equal three. Audrey, yeah. with his experience, me with my experience, and both of us building a new experience, right. a new way to think, and solving solutions, uh, solving problems. And, and uh, was, I say that were so difficult. Was was Greg right then number three? He was. He, he, Greg he was, was number said, three. Was, yes, but he came him? a bit later. How did you find him? Gregory Black was at the World Economic Forum. Ah, of course, I met him there. Right. And when we wanted to hire somebody that would work with Andre and I, somebody advised us to take Gregory Blatt. Yeah. So he came to make the first uh, visit and he said, why do you want me? I'm not from the aviation world. And we said, this is exactly why we want you. Everybody in the world of aviation knows it's impossible. So come outside of this world of aviation yeah. to help us. But that's, that's actually one of my questions. So you, why didn't you just partner with Airbus? 
I mean, the obvious thing to do, you want to fly the world and do some crazy stuff, you go and talk to Airbus, it's obvious. And if not Airbus, then I don't know, Lockheed or, or Boeing or something. And you rejected all of those. because I, I don't reject no, all of reject those. Them. They, they rejected, rejected me. <laughs> so you did talk to them. Yes, they rejected me and they just laughed. Um, the CEO of Boeing heard a presentation I did in the World Economic Forum in Davos and came to me to say hello. And I said, why don't we do that together with Boeing? He, he looked at me and said, of course not. <laughs> of course not. I remember this one. And then I went to see the number, of two, the number two of, uh, of Airbus, and they don't even answer it mm -hmm. after the meeting. And Tom Enders, who was CEO uh, 15 years yes. later, told me the story. He said, when you initiated the project, my engineer said, don't help him. He will never build the plane. When you build the plane, the engineers came and said, the plane will crash. And when you did not crash, the engineers came back to me and said, we absolutely have to organize and plan electric airplane programs. Well, th this is actually... So, so yeah. we, were, we were really yeah. a trigger for that, but nobody wanted to take the risk but before we succeeded. We met in Davos. And it's funny because you say, you know, you talk to Tom Enders and you talk to this. Of course, we want you at Davos. This is all just, this is all, you know, uh, what you do all day, right? Yes. Uh, and you and I met. And I'm trying to remember which year it was. It was probably something like 2009. Probably at COP15. No, it was, we met before COP15, because I remember having a, even a, a little, I wouldn't say an argument, but a little discussion, we'll come on to that, yes. about, about the role of policy and governments and yes. so on. But we met, I think it was before then, because you, you were about to meet, you were at the Swiss Re pavilion and you were about to talk to them about coming on board i believe as a yes supporter. because they came as a big partner right so i don't know which year <laughs> that would have been probably 2007 or 8 or something yeah. like that yeah. and around that time i remember you did a press conference and a journalist asked you and said is electricity the future of aviation and your response was no it was very clear you said no 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 this is a communications exercise. This is pushing the boundary, and this is going to educate people that you must never take no for an answer, and that everything, you know, that, that the technological boundaries can be much further. But no, and I said it was uh, a way to promote right. clean technologies. Clean technologies, exactly. Yeah. Right? So that would have been, let's say, let's call it 2008, 2007, yeah. 2008. I remember very well. And I remember also when you landed and you did some press, it was like 2016 and we were in Abu Dhabi, maybe January 2017. It was a World Future Energy yes. Summit, I think. And a journalist asked you, um, does this mean all airplanes are going to be electric? And you said, probably everything up to 50 seats. Yes. So what happened? I mean, in that intervening time, what happened? It happened that I did not have the guts in 2008 to say that I wanted to make a revolution in the world of aviation. Because people would have said, Bertrand Picard is completely crazy, he's completely stupid, and he's a dreamer. So even then, you did think that it could, even aviation, which you were not the most knowledgeable proponent. Yes, I, I, was, I was certain that aviation would become electric, uh, but it was not the time where I would have been taken seriously if I was saying it. First, I had to fly around the world. And when I flew around the world, then I had the credibility to say that aviation would become electric in 10 years for 50 seaters, up to 50 seaters. I think above 50 seaters, it would be hydrogen, it will be biofuel, things like that, or synthetic. Because I was going to ask, and then what's the, you know, if you, in 2016, you said up to 50 seaters, what do you say now if somebody says, uh, is the future of aviation uh, electric? Who, uh, now, now I'm saying that. Uh, four, years ago, five year, uh, four years ago, I said in 10 years, so we have only six years left to do it. Up to 50 seats. Up to 50 seats. Because seat. I think what's going to happen, and I, it, you know, I've, um, let's put it this way, when, back in my Cambridge days, I could have become, in another parallel universe, I would have become an aviation, uh, an aerospace engineer. We could have flown together. We could have flown yeah. We were destined, we were destined uh, to end up sitting here. Yes, but, but you um, know, we still have 40 years of our life so <laughs> we can do it. So, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, um, but I think we're going to end up with an electric drivetrain. So it could be hydrogen, but the motors, it seems to me, uh, are going to be electric. They're just better. It's a better solution. More yes. torque, less vibration, more efficient. Less maintenance. Less maintenance. Exactly. Much, much yeah. more secure. Yeah. 
but that's not generally and the efficiency. Yeah. You know, if you have a thermal engine, it's about thirty percent the efficiency. Yeah. It's really low. With I a, thought the with an electric, are even high, are yeah, but with an electric yeah. engine, you're at ninety-seven. Yeah. yeah. So of course, if you feed the electric engine with batteries, or you feed it to the fuel cell with hydrogen, at least you have the efficiency of the engine. Yeah. And you know, I think it's going to go even to the larger uh, airframes beyond fifty seats, sixty seats, because it's just so much more efficient. Yeah, so much more efficient. But maybe it will be a type of it'll be a... synthetic fuels or things, you know, where you put yes. hydrogen, CO2 together, things like that. Yeah. And then, but then you'll generate electricity, but the motors will be electric. Yeah. And, you know, it is incredible how fast this thing is moving. I wrote a piece in 2018 um, for Bloomberg New Energy Finance yes. called Planes, Trains and Automobiles, the Electric Remake. Yes. And... People are like, whoa, this is very, you know, Michael's got a bit kind of crazy and so on and that. But now, you know, there's NASA has a program, Boeing has a program, Airbus has a program, and, and, and it seems to be much yes. more accepted. But because, because it's logical, it's not only ecological, it's logical to be more efficient. It's yeah. logical to pollute less, to put less particles in the atmosphere. The, the air pollution is killing six to seven million people per year. So it's not only a question of climate change, it's a question that it can be us who have a right. cancer of the lungs. Although, frankly, most of that, as you know, I'm always kind of, to kind of jump on the, on, on, the, on the hype, but most of that is actually, unfortunately, in the developing world, with people still cooking with, with wood and charcoal and animal dung. Yeah, but it's also more. the capitals of Europe, yeah, it's, it's also, also Paris, it it's also Absolutely. in America. Absolutely. No, it, it, it is. The cars, the cars are doing a yeah. lot of harm. And uh, I drive an electric car, a uh, Kona from Lida. Yes. It's absolutely brilliant. Vibrations, no noise, more acceleration. Yeah. You, I, 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 I charge the car at home. Do you know, it, I knew that I was in the right place this evening when I arrived, when I saw the electric corner. Yes. Because I remember the day you picked it up. Um, you were at the Geneva uh, auto show. Yes, exactly. Two years ago. Exactly. I ran into you and you were the jangle. You had the keys to your new car. Extraordinary. Um, but... A question then, and it brings together a few things we've already touched on. Does incumbency make you, uh, what does it do? Why is it that it's not the incumbents? It's not the Airbus and the Boeing that are the first to innovate. It's not the Ford and the GM and the Daimler and the Volkswagen, it's the Tesla. So now Clayton Christensen, who's a great professor of, um, sadly deceased now, uh, would say that this is the attacker's advantage because you don't have the baggage. But What's your, what's your explanation for why there's so much inertia in these big companies that have all the resources? They could all move faster than a Tesla. They could all move faster than a, than a, than a, than a, than a, a Picard and a Bosch bag in, in, in innovating, but they don't do it. Why not? Because they are prisoners of old ways of thinking, prisoner of the past success, prisoner of old strategies, and they are doing for too long something that has worked well in the past and they don't try to change the future they live in the past so they will disappear if they don't change is and it also why, with, sorry i, I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt go ahead yeah and, and and why is the car industry changing thanks to tesla and tesla was not a car manufacturer he was a billionaire from the world of internet he had no idea how to make a car so basically he took what he knew computer screen and built a tesla around it and now all the automotive industry is running behind to desperately have a part of the market share. And it's like this almost everywhere. It's the small guy who is waking up the old industry. But is it also to do with just capital intensity and the investments that you've made? I mean, is there a kind of a, uh, a, a natural propensity just to protect what you've, you know, what you've already invested in? I, you know, yes, I think they so it want feels more to... than just psychological. I don't know. Yeah, they want to keep the system going as long as they can. And I'm sure that if the CEO was chosen for 50 years, he would not behave the same way than being CEO for five years with stock options after five years, because he just wants to make the most profit in five years. And then he takes the stock options and doesn't care about the rest. But if you, if you own your company, usually it's the case when you have a small company, you, you own it. It's a startup, you, and you're thinking of the future, not the past. Very interesting, though, because actually, if you look at the European car companies, 
their CEO may want five years and stock options on, but they're actually owned by these old European industrial families who are investing for 50 years. So why don't they say to the CEO, look, it's pretty obvious which way the wind's blowing and this is what we want you to do. But it's, and maybe it's happening now. Maybe that's exactly what, what happened but because you know, these companies are now shifting. You have, you have financial reasons. You need to recover your depreciation, yeah. your investment. You have all these financial rules. But most of it is psychological. A lot of people are not pioneers and explorers like you and I. People sleep in the certitudes, in the habits. They have the conviction that they are doing well. And they have all the good explanations to tell you that it will not change. And when I was speaking with car manufacturers uh, five, six years ago about electric cars, hybrid, uh, hydrogen, they were laughing at me. They were telling me, telling me it's an anecdote, you're a dreamer, it will not happen. And yeah. now they are sweating because they see the, the, the wind changing direction completely. But they are not part of this change. So, Other people yeah. made the change. We, and I respect always the people who make the change, and not the one who resists. So we, we could go down a rabbit hole and talk about fuel cell cars, but I don't want to because that, that, that one is... That, I mean, I, I, fuel I, cell car, it's an electric <clears> car anyway. It's just a way to I store know, energy. But it's, also, but it's a very, very inefficient way to store energy. So I'm a big... I, 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 you've got yes. an electric car. I think that's the right one. The battery is 99.9% .9 efficient to store the energy. Yeah. Yeah. The hydrogen, much less. But, yes, but yeah. if you have electricity that would be wasted because you have sun or wind and you don't know how to use the electricity, then it's a good way to make hydrogen. Yeah. So I think because 50% yeah. efficiency compared to zero, it's an infinite efficiency. Here's the deal. At the next Solar Impulse Foundation World Alliance yes. board meeting, yes. we'll go into exactly this question. Yes. Because, um, because if you try to build all of your electrolysis uh, all the, all of the, so if you invest in the capital equipment to do electrolysis, compression, storage, etc., mm. just because of curtailed renewables, that's a really inefficient solution. But yeah. I don't want to go down too much in that. Uh, this is a good discussion. We'll have Absolutely. to, but it's not. You know, we'll, 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 we'll. Yeah, because we'll, we are going to lose the, we'll lose the viewers. The, I mean, who knows? You know, <laughs> but we'll give you the result yeah. of that discussion. Exactly. Exactly. We'll come back. And anyway, we're going, to, we're going to have to do more cleaning up episodes in the future. But that's a great discussion. And you know, the, but the bottom line is a different one. The bottom line is that innovation. We are both utterly convinced that um, that innovation gets us out of the uh, planetary problems that we've got. The, 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 we're threatening to breach not just climate, but other planetary boundaries. And you and I have consistently, since I've known you, um, been banging the drum in different ways for innovation. You know, you by, by example, me by analysis, uh, but it's all been about innovation. And so far we've set up the kind of, there are the innovators and the incumbents, but there is a third group out there and those are the degrowthers. Yes. Those are the people who neither want the incumbency to be maintained, but they don't believe in innovation. They think that all we have to do is um, stop consuming and, mm. and uh, unwind our economy and unwind uh, what we have. Now, what do you say to them? I mean, I've, I've, read, I've read some of the things you've written, but, but if you meet them, what do you say? I tell them that degrowth, and we see it with the coronavirus crisis, is just bringing dozens of millions of people unemployed, making the world suffer much more on a much more short term uh, than the climate change. Uh, degrowth is just destroying everything. But illimited growth, like people believe that we can do, is bringing to an so, to, to a ecological chaos, so it doesn't work either. So what I believe is that we have to go for qualitative growth. Qualitative growth is when you make money and you create jobs by replacing what is polluting by what is protecting the environment. And here you have the market of the century. So basically, you have an economic growth because you make money and create jobs, but you become so much more efficient that you have a degrowth in the waste. You have less waste. You have less uh, natural resources that are wasted, less energy that is wasted. So basically, you use the resources much better, and this brings much more profit. 
So I think there is a win-win that you, you can do at that stage. I find it strange for me to be arguing on behalf of the degrowthers, right? Because normally it's very much the other way around. But they would say, oh, this is all sounds very good, but it's never been done. It is completely impossible. You can't have infinite growth on a finite planet, and there's no examples of what you're talking about. So I say that the impossible, I love it, because I already showed several times that the impossible is not in the reality. The impossible is in the mindset of the people who cannot imagine another future than their past. So saying that growth, illimited growth, is impossible in a finite uh, Earth, that's not something impossible. It's just something obvious. You cannot do it because it doesn't work. It's not arguing if it's possible or not. It just doesn't work. You cannot have unlimited growth. Physical growth. Physical, physical growth. Yeah. But you can, you can have an unlimited economic growth. It means that the people can earn more money. The companies and the corporations can earn more money by putting on the market what is protecting the environment. By, what is, by introducing what is more efficient. So the economic growth is always possible. And what we have to get rid of is this illimited or unlimited consumption, because this doesn't work. So you need a degrowth in the waste that you produce, but you need a growth in the economic system. Otherwise, the, the people will just not accept it. If you have dozens of millions of people who are unemployed, it will make social, war, uh, social unrest, it will make civil wars, it will just not work. People need a social protection, they need a salary, they, they, they need their job. Well, that's incredibly um, apposite right now because around the world there are 300 million people involved in travel and tourism. Yes. 300 million people whose jobs are travel and tourism. So if you're a degrowther, you're celebrating now, presumably, because um, we're not flying, we're not driving, we're not going to conferences, we're not going to, on holidays. But 300 million people, what are they supposed to do um, in order to feed their families? They suffer a lot. And you cannot imagine a system of degrowth where you make all the people suffer because they don't have a penny to feed their family. It just doesn't work. You need to give them jobs, and you need to give them social protection in order to help them to have a good quality of life. But what I mean is that the people should earn their life not to produce junk that is consumed too much, but to produce good quality that protects the environment um, and that enters into new type of industries, like the waste industry. We, we, we have seen only a, a, a fragment of the waste industry. We can develop it hundredfold just because you can do so much with the waste. You can do so much to be more efficient. You can do so much to protect the environment and to make it in a profitable way. And this is the goal of the Solar Impulse Foundation. It's to give an answer at the same time to the people who want to keep unlimited growth and the one who want degrowth. Because we, we can find the, like in Taoism. You know, in Taoism, yeah. you, the goal is to reunite the extremes in order to find unicity out of the extremes. And I think qualitative growth is what allows it. We're getting very, very philosophical. I think this is the yin and the yang and so on. And I'm, yeah, not, a, exactly. I'm not an expert on, on, on Taoism. But, um, but it's, it's, it's you know, definitely, I think we see the, you know, the end point exactly the same. You know, ultimately, we're going to be recycling on a molecular level using the infinite energy that is, that is uh, not infinite, but I mean, many, many, many multiples, orders of magnitudes of multiples, more than we need. Um, and I suppose I've tried to engage in that discussion through thermodynamics and explaining that we can't have infinite physical growth, but the economy is not a manifestation no, of physical exactly. consumption. And you use the word reducing consumption. I would like us to consume more services, more dematerialized, yes, exactly. more medical knowledge. I'd like us to use more cultural uh, output and the, you know so we can consume as much of that as we yes. possibly you know um, and we can make money with it and we have we give good quality of life yeah. to everyone with it but but i don't I, I find myself getting into sort of arguments because i try to persuade and one thing that you wrote which i like you you wrote a piece you may not remember it called how to raise 170 million well, i remember it I tell you, I remember. <laughs> and one of the things you said was don't persuade motivate yes 
uh, maybe that's what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> but you know, when you persuade, maybe the viewers should understand that. When you try to persuade somebody to convince him, you fight against the part of the other one who wants to say no. And when you motivate, you make an alliance with the part of the other one who wants to say yes. So when you motivate, you, you are not fighting against the other one. But when you persuade, you fight against the other one. And do you know the quotation from Antoine Saint-Exupéry, who I'm sure is one of your heroes? Uh, yes, so, absolutely. Um, his quotation about how um, if you want someone to build a ship... What is it Give him the taste of the sea, don't... Yeah, yeah, him says, to if you want to then. build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Yeah. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Exactly. And give um, the wish to do something. Yes, I, I, I knew that would resonate, and I, I got to work on my own ability to do that and, and not to just hound people. With, yes, but you know, at the uh, same time, we should not aim for wishful thinking because you have a lot of people who say, Look, we have to fight climate change by introducing the beauty of nature, introducing the brotherhood of human beings. Fuel cell cars. Yes, and, 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 this, <laughs> and this doesn't really yeah. work. You need to be very practical. And I, I, when I came back from all my expeditions, in the beginning I was saying, the world is beautiful, life is a miracle, we have to protect it. But no one, no decision makers wanted to hear that. Yeah. So now I'm very practical. Now I say you're going to create more jobs and make more profit if you protect the environment than if you destroy it. And I have today 652 proofs right. that it works and in a couple of months it will be 1,000 proofs. And, and indeed that's... So maybe we're kind of coming at this from slightly different starting points because I, I actually didn't come at it from the starting point of trying to save the planet or do anything. I just wanted to create a good business. Yes. Um, but it became very quickly clear to me that data and analysis, actually, since these solutions are better, they are ecological but also logical, therefore my sort of angle of attack it was to say, well, I just provide information and data. Yes. Yes. I myself can do a good business whilst doing good by providing data on solutions that do that are good business whilst doing good. And so then you've come at it for after the experience of flying and, and both the balloon and the, and the aircraft. And now, you know, we're sort of trying to do the same thing again with different, very different styles. So you're, but when did you, did you already have the idea for the, the efficient solutions while you were in the air or while you were working up to that? Or was that something that kind of came once you landed and signed all the books and done no, all the... what what I had at first was really the wish to promote clean technologies and renewable energies, so showing that with that you can achieve impossible goals. That was my my vision with solar impulse. Now I always knew that after the flight, I would have the credibility to do something very practical, and the idea of the one thousand solutions came just after the flight. You know, I was at, the, I was at COP22 in Marrakesh. Marrakesh. Yeah. I was announcing the creation of the World Alliance for Efficient Solutions. And I was telling that we would put together all the people who have solutions that are profitable for the environment and so on. And I was looking at the audience. Nobody was really enthusiastic. To have another world alliance and another group of people doing something like that. And I said, okay, I have to find something now to, to, to wake them up. And I said, I promise you that in a couple of years, I bring 1,000 solutions, 1,000 solutions to the world. And uh, then everybody applauded and said, fantastic. And that was the title of all yeah. the press release. And, 1,000 solutions for the environment. But it took a bit yeah. more than a couple of years. It, well, no, hang on a second. But I'm yeah. going to hold you to account here. Because when you stood up, you said that you would have 1,000 solutions in Poland. Yes. Ah, no, wait a minute. So this is, I found, this is in April, two, in 18. So I don't, know, I don't know what you said in Marrakesh. But you said you, said you did it in Poland. 16, and I said in two years. So it okay, so 18, 18. So 2018. And, and we're now in 2000. So we're in 2020. And you only found 652. Yeah. I mean, 
have you been have you been slacking? Uh, are they harder to find, or has the process of certifying them, which we talk about in our board meetings, been harder than you thought? Not harder, but different than I thought in the beginning. In the beginning, honestly, I thought we collect one thousand solutions, we just use the logical way to analyze them, and we make a portfolio. And when I brought this to my team, they said, it's not serious enough. We have no proof that these solutions are really profitable. They really protect the environment. We need experts to analyze them and we need a label to prove it. And I said, yes, you are right. And it took a year and a half to prepare the label, to find the experts and to start the process. So finally, we started the process about two years after uh, uh, Marrakesh. So in Poland, we had only 100 solutions, but they have the label. And, uh, and now uh, it's, they are really coming. They are really flooding in because all these startups and even the, the big corporations that have this type of solutions, they know the value of our label. They know that I can really promote them because I know most of the heads of states on the planet currently. Uh, so it's an advantage for them. So, so now it's exponential. It, it's funny because one of our first conversations when you invited me onto the advisory board was I said, this is really a big ask because um, I had been on various you know, judging panels and yeah. obviously also qualifying you know, who, which companies get to be covered by what, yes. was then, what was initially new energy finance, you know, which ones do we think are actually doing the right things and so on. And I knew that you have to build a huge infrastructure for yeah. a, to have a thousand um, means you're going to have to screen two, three, five thousand. Yes. And the screening is not just something you make up, you know, it's something that needs to be very systematic. Exactly. So you've worked with partners on that. And uh, so you're saying partners. it's now a, a, a yes. well-oiled machine, which I'm, I'm exactly. delighted and to And now we have about 400 experts. Yeah. And uh, we do the pre-screening, we send them the submission forms and they make the analysis, the assessment. Give us a few examples. Are you allowed to choose, like, it's like asking what are your favorite children? What's your favorite, you know, but which, what, have you got any favorites amongst the 652? Yeah, there are some I, I really love. One is called anti-smog. It's a module that costs 500 euros. You install it on your thermal engine in your car and it allows you to reduce by 80%, 80 percent, eight zero percent, the particles that are emitted and by 20 percent the fuel consumption. So on a taxi, for example, it becomes profitable after six months. You recover the investment in six months. This should be mandatory on right. all the cars. You save money on the fuel and you stop to poison people in the street. Yeah. So this is one example I love. Another anti system, anti-smog. Anti it's okay. a British startup, by the way. Fabulous. I mean, I would love to spend an hour finding out how, yes. how, how does this work? How is this possible? Yeah. Why is everybody else? So, why has everybody been so stupid not to do this uh, before? But give us, give us another few examples. Yes, um, a company that is taking the waste, putting the waste at molecular level, and using these molecules to do high-value solvent uh, waxes. Uh, plastics and, and things like that. So this like is that. a thermochemical process that breaks down, presumably organic It's, a, waste, and, it's a, 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 a en enzymatic. A enzymatic catalyst yeah. and so on. Okay. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. As long as we produce waste. Because they need a feedstock. Yes. Yeah, exactly. We'll, but we'll, we we'll always produce waste. We'll, and well, we always will. Exactly. It yeah. will be a circular economy. And instead of having people who make money on a straight line, there will be people making money all the and way what's around. What's that one called? Uh, this one, I don't remember the name. Okay, but you've got the website, the, the Solar Impulse exactly. Foundation. No, you, you, go, you, go on the, yeah. you go on the website of Solar Impulse. Um, and it's a solution. It is, it is yeah. Clariter. Clari you have Clariter, you have Carbios, and you have UBQ. Okay, I know. Who are the three yeah. who are right. taking the waste to, to, to do something with them. And what are you doing to help those? Because you say you know the heads of state of all the countries of the world, which I'm sure is pretty much true, but they are not specifying pollution control technologies or renewable energy technologies. Those are the procurement directors of companies or individuals making purchase decisions. So how are you trying to kind of get these, accelerate these solutions? I want to show them which solutions can be used in their country and how we can boost the job creation and the industrial profits. 
So we started with Scotland, with France, with Belgium, Luxembourg, and uh, I hope we will extend uh, to all the other countries once we have the, the thousand solutions. And because you know, you, you have two ways to, to, to solve the, the climate change issues. You can identify the problems, then you look for solutions. But you can do much better than that. You can bring all the solutions, whatever are the problems, and you look which of these hundreds and hundreds of solutions can be implemented and right. make more profit and protect the environment better. And this is what I call the piranha uh, theory. If you have just one piranha who bites you, you don't even feel it. Right. But when you have a thousand piranha, they just eat you in one second. And this is what we can do with the pollution so and the environment. We're going, to, we're going to strip the polluters to the bone. And what's going to happen, in fact, maybe this is something we should also talk about at the next board meeting. What happens when you have a thousand? Because you know, some of them will fall by the wayside, you'll need to replenish the number, or do you, do you go for 10,000? What, what happens next? We will think? continue. We will continue. It, I will not give the goal of 2,000 or 3,000. We'll continue just to increase the portfolio. Nobody, nobody will listen until you say, right, 5,000. No, 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 because we have the 1,000, okay. and then we'll go to see all the heads of state okay. with the official delegation and show them and really, you know, give them the tools yeah. that they need to do the environmental policy that they promised. Because they all say, we have to do something, we have to do something, but they don't know how to do it. You have to be really clear. Absolutely. They don't know yeah. how to do it, and we want to help them to, to have the tools in order to act. And I suspect, using your piranha analogy, that by the time you, you know, that will get you so far, but there will still be difficult sectors, cement industry, whatever, and also around the world, different economies. So, you know, it may be that the right number is 10,000 piranhas, ultimately, or, or, or 20,000, whatever, but, but that's a... With a 1,000 solution... We'll get you quite far. You go very far. Yeah. I, I believe you can already reduce by about 60% the, the CO2 emissions. Yeah just with the technologies that already exist now that we can implement. And it's many, already a lot. And many of those will have co-benefits, but we'll also have to worry about uh, the phosphorus cycle and we have to worry about all yeah. sorts of, there's plenty of, yeah. I don't think you want to run out of things to, no, to, no, to worry I, about. I will to, not be unemployed. To, to innovate about. Right? Well, unemployed. Uh, well, I have to specify yeah. that I do that for free. Uh, this is really my, my uh, contribution right. To, to the world. I earned my life giving speeches, motivational speeches for big companies, uh, but half of my life it's to promote these solutions, to work for free with my foundation. And, and that brings me to the next subject, which is COVID, because I also made some money. Not, I'm probably not as uh, in demand as you as a, as a speaker for corporates, but I have my moments. COVID has been, but there's, I don't think either of us are complaining about the fact that we have a year with very poor but very poor revenues on our speaking. Um, but it has been um, a tremendous economic shock. And you have um, rounded up your corporate supporters yes. to produce a letter um, a, a, yes. a, 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 and a statement, a commitment. What does the commitment say? It was an open letter that we put in Le Monde. It was in Financial Times also, where the 12 big corporations that support the Solar Pulse Foundation make the commitment to go for clean technologies, renewable energies to protect the environment, but much more than that. They are calling the governments very actively to be more ambitious in the energy and environmental policy. They are calling for more environmental regulations. In, as part of the rebuilding of yes, the COVID. Yes, to give, to, to give conditions uh, for the subsidies. Uh, just, just an example, if you give subsidies today to a car company who is producing thermal engines, it's wasted money because in five years' time, these cars will not be allowed to enter in the center of the cities. So you need to produce less polluting cars. This is the same for the real estate. You need now to build houses and buildings who do not pollute, who are well insulated, who integrate renewable energy. Uh, zero energy houses, all this in, in the industry, all the new processes, this is where you have to invest. And have you spoken to Fatih Birol, whom I'm sure yes. you know, I mean, yes. I'm, Absolutely. Know from all sorts of conferences. Uh, Director the, General of the of, of International the, in, Energy Agency. Exactly, so he runs the IEA and he's a brilliant visionary on all 
all yes. of this. And uh, the IEA has produced a report on um, the uh, sustainable recovery. Yes. And basically making the point that if we bounce back by pouring money at the technologies of the past, we will have what happened after the financial crisis, which is a big bounce back in yes. emissions. But if we do it right, we should see a secular reduction. And actually, 2019 could be peak emissions year in the history of the planet. So you would, yeah. I, uh, and I'm really working for that in order to implement all these solutions that can make what you say come true. Yeah. And, and let's see what happens in the run up to COP uh, 26 Six. in Glasgow. Glasgow in next year, because I think that, um, you know, there's, a, it was brilliant that it was put off until then, because yes. now we have enough time to work and to put the alliances together, mm. you and, and Fatih, and if I can help, so that we can try to uh, lock in um, that sort of secular peak in 2019, yeah. um, but without, you know, without uh, slowing down the recovery, because people are hurting out there. Uh, people are sure. really hurt, yes. Yeah. But it's clear that if you come back to the old world, we will find what we had before. It was a society that was fragile, unfair, polluting, dangerous, yeah. and uh, just a virus would destabilize it completely. Now we need to have a society that is much more fair, uh, that is more stable, and that runs its income on the protection of the environment, and not on the destruction so, of all the natural assets. So we've done the equivalent of dumping the Breitling orbiter in the Mediterranean, and we have to build it back differently. Yes. We have to build, so it's, uh, the, the, that learning has yeah, to take place, yeah, otherwise yeah. we're going to end up in the same place. One thing about those 12 names yes. that I have to ask you about, or I have to raise, um, there are two women amongst the 12. There's one uh, who is a minority, who's a, a Moroccan, actually one of the women is, is, is Moroccan. The CEO of Salve. Um And there's only one. Ilham Kadri. Exactly, Ilham Kadri. And the other one is uh, Andri Guy from Air France. From Air France, exactly. But only one of them is not between the ages of 50 and 62. Yes. So it's not a very diverse group. These are 12 of the most powerful CEOs in, uh, I, I don't know if you restricted it to Europe, but they all, I think, are Europeans. Well, um, they're worldwide. They're worldwide. Listening, but they're operating worldwide, globally. LVMH, exactly. Uh, so these are global commercial yes. business leaders. Um, but they're not diverse by any real metric. If you envisage a world where we'll succeed, we address climate change, uh, innovation, we bounce back from COVID, and in 2030, we are really feeling like, okay, we, we kind of cracked it. Can you envisage a world like that where a random group of 12 senior executives would still be 10 men, one minority, you know, and, and no, all from no. such a narrow age group and so on. No, we need more diversity. And we need more diversity also, because if all the people look the same, they will usually have always the same way of thinking. And we need people who come from the outside, people who shake the tree in order to, to bring uh, innovation, creativity, and, and so on. But, if you but look, you know, Michael, yeah. I'm not... I'm not personally responsible for the nomination and the appointment of the CEOs in the big corporations. No, 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 of course not. No, but I raise it. I use it as a hook to raise the, the yes. issue because obviously, um, you know, I think certainly the, the question of gender, I've been on a couple of, I am on a couple of advisory boards um, and it's something that I've worked on and I feel very proud of what I've done. But when it comes to minorities, I think I've done a much worse job, much less. Mm. And... Um, and so I kind of, I, I, it's, you know, I feel, a, I feel it's a responsibility for, you know, here we are, look, we're two white, middle-aged, middle-class, successful guys. I don't even know how much privilege, um, you know, I've used in order to get, to get where I am, but I'm sure it's not nothing. Um, do you, do you look back and think, well, maybe there was a bit more that you could have done in, in your life, in these adventures to be a bit more diverse, to, you know, to, 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 do, you know, are we part of the problem? No, in our team, we had a lot of women, but not all in the, in the same part of the team. We had only two women engineers. 
but we had 90% of women in communication. So it's also up to the women to choose jobs where they will be well represented. There are not enough women who are making engineering schools. Not enough. So we have That's to push a, that. This and is getting, politics this also. Could, yeah. You don't have enough women who went through. But this politics. could get quite controversial because, you know, I, I was on the board of Transport for London and we were, um, you know, uh, the big project is Crossrail. And at one point I asked about that we were having a problem. There's not enough, there's, there are bus routes in London where the drivers have no access to toilets. Mm. Right? Now, to me, that's a human rights issue and a, and yeah. a safety issue. Yeah. But because we were, issue, we were, I was challenging the management team about that, I also, when it came to Crossrail, next on the agenda, I said, well, I hope that we've got enough toilets for the Crossrail drivers. And they said, yes, we're building these stations, we'll have plenty of toilets. I said, will they be 50-50 women and men? And they said, well, why would there be? Because there'll be far fewer women drivers than men. To which my question is, well, maybe there are fewer women drivers because they haven't got toilets. Maybe. And so that's why I asked very provocatively yeah. whether we're part of a problem or whether we could do more or whether we could have done more. I, I just, but I, you know, it's, it's not in our world, in the rich part of the world, that the problem is the worst. And I've seen serving for 12 years as a goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Population Fund, what is the real problem of women in the developing world? Most of the poverty comes because the women are not well educated, because they are left to parts, because they are, have no access to a, to, a, to a job. And if you want to fight poverty, you have to educate women, give them more power. And in this case, you have much richer communities. So I, I, I was really fighting to empower women for 12 years but I was doing it in the places where the women were suffering the most. And the, this is where the leverage was the highest. No, so, of course, we have to do it here, but let, let's see really where is the center of gravity of the problem in the yeah. world. So, now, I'm just conscious of time. That's a topic I would love to continue. Because it's such, a, it's such, a, uh, such an important one. But um, conscious of time, you said it yourself. Um, We've got about 40 more years. Right? We're not exactly the same age, but we're a similar age. We've got about 40 more years. Um, you know, you're in good shape. You're fit. We, can, we still haven't skied together, but I'm sure if we did, we would be... But we drink, we drink local wine We're drinking together. Well, but very nice <laughs> local wine. We're competitive, we would, but we would, you know. So how are you going to use your next 40 years? Are there any more physical adventures? Are you going to say, oh, you know, there's, a, there's still, you know, Elon Musk is recruiting people to go to Mars? Um, or are you, do you see it now, your role is the sort of, uh, the, 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 the senior uh, leader, the visionary, and you're gonna stick more with the communications side of things? Um, my way of doing was always to have big adventures serving a message. So now, if I can have another big adventure to promote the 1,000 solutions once we have them, uh, I would accept to do it. And there are a couple of interesting things to do. Uh, you can very well have uh, airships now who work on biofuel, on hydrogen. You can have uh, solar airplanes, a two-seater solar airplane that will not cross the oceans like solar impulse, but I can take the president of a country with me and uh, in the air, I said, now you sign for the implementation of all these technologies. Otherwise, I kick you out to the parachute. Oh, just <laughs> laughing. But um, there, there are some interesting things that we can do now with renewable energies and all the big, the big adventures of the past that were consuming a lot of fuel and making a lot of pollution. You have to redo them in a completely clean way. And, and this is something I would love to do. So you think that you probably will get itchy feet again? And... Uh... And, and you know, pack up your adventurer bags and do you know do do something else. Yeah, at least once more. At least once more. Well, gosh, that's maybe a, two or three. Maybe two yeah. or three, because that's um, you know, that, then that makes me feel like I ought to sort of go and dust off my uh, my my uh, my ice axe and go and do some more climbing. Or, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I could do. I can't no, ski moguls you. anymore. Yeah. I can think of something. Yeah, but do it for do it for a cause. 
Uh, it's funny because I, in my crazy exploits, yes. I always did it for me. Although they were competitive, I was a competitive yeah. skier. Really, I was competing with myself. I mean, I knew. Let's put it. Let's be honest. I, you know, I, I, people. When I stand up and speak, sometimes I'm introduced to you know, Michael Liebreich, and he was on the Olympic team. And I say, well, you know, you're probably all thinking in the audience, did he win? And I, I joke. I say, look, I was on the British team, British ski team. Um, but I was competing with myself, never really um, yeah. to become the Olympic champion, if I'm you know, honest. So mm. I don't know. It's, um, oh, well, no, but, you know, it, when I was alone in the middle of an ocean, thousands of kilometers from any rescue, alone in the cockpit of Solar Impulse, I just loved it. Uh, it was maybe the moment of my life where I felt the best because I did not have the weight of habits, of beliefs, of convictions, of planning. Yeah. I was there, yeah. I was flying the plane, I felt okay. so well. So that's like me on so a vocal that, field, that, for that, sure. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it, it's exactly like you. Yeah. Now, if I was doing such a communication around it, it was not to promote myself, it was to promote the message I wanted to send. So if I want to fly alone on the ocean uh, with a solar airplane, just for me, I don't need to make a press conference before starting and after landing. But if I do it and I make the press conference and I promote a message, then it becomes useful. And then you feel so much better because what you do is great for yourself, but it's useful for, for the others. And this is really what I always try to do in my life. I wanted an exciting and useful life. Because if it's only exciting, it's selfish. And if it's only useful, it's boring. <laughs> well, I think you probably got the trade-off pretty well. So I think it worked pretty well. <laughs> exciting and useful, and another 40 years of exciting and useful. Uh, and if anybody can deliver that, then I'm pretty sure it's you. It's been a huge, huge pleasure. Thank you so, so much for your hospitality, for the very, very nice wine. The Swiss wine is good, good, huh? Very nice Swiss wine from the vineyards that from are just in front of Exactly, uh, just in front of my house. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so we make the COVID... Uh, hug, which is not like this, but ah, well, we'll do the the COVID the COVID bow exactly. exactly. Uh, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. It's always great to speak with you and debate with you. <laughs> Lovely. So it's been a huge pleasure talking to Bertrand Picard here at his home, surrounded by three generations of memorabilia of an extraordinary family of adventurers explorers and communicators. Being exciting, having an exciting life whilst doing good. What a fantastic message. My guest next week will be Roger Dennis from the other side of the world. He's a Kiwi, he's a futurologist, he's a thinker, a really original thinker, brilliant conversationalist. I think you're gonna enjoy my conversation next week with Roger Dennis. Mm -hmm.